Hi everyone, welcome back to part four of the short story by Damon Runyon from his novel on Broadway called Cemetery Bait. And if you remember, uh, Gentleman George was uh, caught, well he wasn't caught, he's hiding in the closet in the boudoir of uh, Mrs. Colonel Samuel B. Venus and her so-called lover Count Tommaso. As they discuss how to get rid of her husband. They've now left and he can carry on with his work. Let's we'll see what happens next. As soon as they depart, I turned to my own business of opening the little can and removing the jewellery which I delivered to Tommy and Trata, who gave it to Lou Adolia, and this is the time that La Lou Adolia gets $80,000 from the insurance companies for the returning of the goods and then disappears with all the sugar. And without as much saying, I, yeah, no to anybody. But I am getting ahead of my story. A couple of days later, I am reclining on the beach with Tommy and Trotter, taking a little sun for my complexion. When who comes along and the bathing suit, which displays a really remarkable shape, but Mrs. Colonel Samuel B. Venus. And who is with her? But the stern-looking character who doctors me up on the train and at first, I have a half a notion to jump up and say hello to him and thank him for all his kindness to me about the fish. But he looks right through me as if he never sees me before in his life. And I can see that he does not remember me. Or if he does, he does not care to make anything of it. So I do not give him a blow. Because the way I look at it, the fewer people who you know in this world, the better off you are. Ah, but I asked Tommy and Trata who the stern-looking character is, and I'm somewhat surprised when Tommy says, Why? He is Colonel Samuel B. Venus, the party you knock off the other night, but let us not speak of that now. Colonel Samuel B. Venus is a most irascible character, and he is making quite a trip about matters, and he is very fortunate here for us that he and his wife are sailing to New York, because... The stout fellow was getting nervous about the outcry. By the way, I do not wish to seem inhospitable in suggesting your departure from these pleasant shores, but it may be a good idea for you to take it in on the Jesse Owens until the beef is chilled. The many nightingales in these ports, and they will sing to the Lord a very slight provocation, for instance, such as characters Count Tommaso. I notice him around here, nuzzling up to Mrs. Coyne or Samuel B. Venus, and while the chances are he is on a business mission of his own, Count Tommaso knows you, and it always my opinion that he's a singer at heart. Well, I do not mention the incident in Mrs. Coyne or Samuel B. Venus's boudoir at Tommy and Trotter, because in the first place, I do not consider it any of his business, and in the second place, I know Tommy is not apt to be interpreted in such a manner, but I get to thinking about the conversation between Mrs. Coyne of Samuel B. Venus and Count Tommaso, and I also get to thinking about Coyne of Samuel B. Venus himself being so nice to me in connection with the, la with the bad fish. And, thinks I, as long as I may take my departure, a little sea voyage may be beneficial to my health and I will go on to Camilla and the Castilla myself, and will look up Count Tommaso and admonish him that I will hold him personally responsible if any accident happens to coin Samuel B. Venus, as I feel that it is only fair to do what I can to discharge my debt of gratitude to Colonel Samuel B. Venus concerning the fish. So, when the Castilla sails away a few days later, I am a passenger, and furthermore, I have a nice cabin on the same deck as Colonel Samuel B. Venus and his ever-loving wife, because I always believe in traveling to the best people no matter what. I see Colonel Samuel B. Venus, and I also see Mrs. Colonel Samuel B. Venus on the first day out, and I observe that Colonel Samuel B. Venus is looking st sterner than ever. And also Mrs. Colonel Samuel B. Venus is growing lovelier by the hour. But never do I see Count Tommaso, although I'm pretty sure he does not miss the boat. I figure he's taking Mrs. Colonel Samuel B. Venus's advice about keeping out of sight of Colonel Samuel B. Venus. 
I do not bother to go looking for Count Tommaso on the Castilla to admonish him about Colonel Samuel B. Venus because I figures I'm bound to catch up with him getting off the boat in New York. And in the meantime, Colonel Samuel B. Venus is safe from accident because, especially as it comes up stormy at sea after we are a few hours out, and Colonel Samuel B. Venus and his ever-loving wife seem to be keeping close to their cabin, and in fact, so is everybody else. Well, the storm keeps getting worse, and it's a sleety and cold all around and about, and the sea is running higher than somewhat, and now one night off the Jersey coast, when I am sleeping as peacefully as anything, I'm awakened to a great to-do, and it seems that the Castilla is on fire. Naturally, I do not care to be toasted in my cabin, and so I don my clothes and pop out in the passageway and start for the nearest exit. When I remember, that in the moments of confusion, married characters, male and female, are apt to forget articles of one kind and another, and they come in handy uh, to somebody. Such as me, later on, for instance, bits of jewelry and other portable merchandise. So I try various doors as I go along the passageway, and all of them are open and unoccupied, as the Castilla is an old time vessel, with cabin doors that lock with keys, and not with any snap way of finger rings and bracelets, and I find them. And clips and pins and necklaces and watches and gold cigarette cases and even a few loose bundles of ready scratch. So I'm very glad indeed that I'm gifted with foresight. <laughs> Finally, I come to one door that seems to be locked. And I remember that this is the cabin occupied by Colonel Samuel B. Venus and his ever-loving wife. And after first knocking at the door and receiving no reply, I figured to hastily depart and carelessly lock the door after them. And I also figured that I am bound to garner something of more than an ordinary value there. So I kicked the door in. <laughs> and who was in the cabin on a bed all thrust up like a goose with a towel tied across his mouth to keep him from hollering out loud, but Colonel Samuel B. Venus in person. Naturally, I'm somewhat surprised at this spectacle, and also somewhat embarrassed to have Colonel Samuel B. Venus find me kicking in his door, but of course, this is no time for apologies, so I take a quick swivel about the cabin to see if there are any articles lying around that I might be able to use. I'm slightly disappointed to note that there appears to be nothing and I'm about to make my departure, when all of a sudden I remember my debt of gratitude to Colonel Samuel B. Venus, and I realize that it will be most unkind to leave him in this predicament to be barbecued like a, a, a steer without being able to move hand or foot. So I'm out of my pocket shift and cut him loose, and I also remove the towel as soon as he can talk. Colonel Samuel B. Venus issues a statement to me in a most severe tone of voice as follows. They try to murder me, my own wife, Cora, and a character in a white polo coat and a little cap to match. When the alarm is sounded, she starts screaming, and he comes banging up against our door, and he unlocks it and lets him in before. She lets him in before I have time to think, and then he knocks me down with something I do not know what. The chances are, you know, the chances are, it is a blunt instrument. You may be right, Colonel Samuel B. Venus says. Anyway, after he knocks me down, my own wife, Cora, picks up one of my shoes and starts belting me over the head and the heel. And then she helps the character of the polo coat and the little captain match me up in, and as you find me. It's a scurvy trick, I say. I am half unconscious. But I remember hearing my own wife, Cora, remark that the fire is a wonderful break for them and will save them a lot of bother in New York. And then before they leave, she hits me another belt in the head in the show, and I fear that my own wife, Cora, is by no means the ever-loving help me. I think, in fact, I am now wondering about the overdose of sleeping powders she gives me in London, England in 1931 and about a bomb in my automobile in Los Angeles, California, in 1933. Well, 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 I say. Let us bygones be bygones and get off this tub, as it seems to be getting harder than a ninth-inning finish around here. 
But Cardinal Samuel V. Venus remains very testy about the incident he just describes, and he fumbles around under a pillow on the bed in which I find him, and outs with that thing and opens the cylinder to see if it makes sure it is loaded, and says to me like this, I will shoot him down like a dog. I mean the character in the white polo coat and the little cap to match. He undoubtedly leads my poor little wife, Cora, astray in this, although I do not seem to recall him anywhere in the background of the overdose and the bomb matters. But she is scarcely more than a child, and that does not know right from wrong. He is the one that must die. I wonder who he is. Well, of course, I know Colonel Samuel B. Venus must be talking about Cap Tomaso, but I can't see that Tom Tomaso is a, is a total stranger to him. And while I am by no means opposed to Colonel Samuel B. Venus's sentiments with reference to Count Tomaso, I do not approve of his spirit of forgiveness towards Mrs. Colonel Samuel B. Venus, because I figures that as long as she is around and about Colonel Samuel B. Venus, will always be in danger of accidents. But I do not feel that this is the time for argument, so I finally get him to go up to the deck with me, and as soon as we are on deck, Colonel Samuel B. Venus leaves me and starts running every which way he can. He's looking for somebody. There seems to be some little agitation on deck, with what smoke and flame coming out of the Castilla amidships, and many characters, male and female, running up and down and around and about in the small children crying. Some of the crew are launching knife boats, and then getting into these boats themselves, and pulling away from the pointing ship without waiting for any passengers, which strikes me as most disaster, discourteous of the part of the sailors, in which alarms many passengers, till so they start chucking themselves over the rail into the sea, trying to catch up with the boats. Well, this scene is most distasteful to me, so I retire uh, from the general melee, and go looking. Elsewhere about the ship, Baker and I may find an opportunity to ease myself wildly into a boat before all the seats are taken by sailors, and finally I come up to a group trying to launch a big life raft over the rail. And about this time I observe Colonel Samuel B. Venus standing up against the rail with that thing in his hand and peering this way and that. And then I notice a boat pulling away from the ship. And then the stern of the boat, I see her character in a white polo coat and a little cap to match, and I call the attention of Colonel Samuel B. Venus to same. The boat is so overcrowded that it is far down into water, but the waves, which are running very high, are carrying it away in long lunges, and it is fully one hundred yards off, and is really visible to the naked eye by the light of the flames from the Castilla, only when it rises a moment to the top of a wave. And Colonel Samuel B. Venus looks for some time before he sees wish, what I wish him to see. I spot him now. I recognize that white polo coat and a little cap to match. And with this, he ups with that thing and goes tooty toot toot out across the water three times. And the last I see of the white polo coat and the little cap to match they're folding up together very gently, just as a big wave washes the boat off into the darkness beyond the light of the burning ship. By this time, the raft is in the water, and I take Colonel Samuel B. Venus and chuck him down on the raft, and then I jump after him, and the raft is soon overcrowded, and I give foot to a female character who is on the raft before anybody else and ease her off into the water. As this female character disappears into the raging sea, I am not surprised to observe that she is really nobody but Count Tommaso. As I seem to remember seeing Count Tommaso making Mrs. Colonel Samuel B. Venus change clothes with him at the point of a knife. Well, some of the boats get ashore, and some do not, and in one that does arrive, they find the late Mrs. Colonel Samuel B. Venus, and everybody is somewhat surprised to note she is in the male garments with a white polo coat and a little cap to match. I wish to call attention to the public service I rendered to easing counter mass off the raft, because here is a character who is undoubtedly a menace to the sanctity of the American home. And I take pride in the fact that I discharge my debt of gratitude to Colonel Samuel B. Venus 
and it is not my fault that he permits himself to be so overcome by his experience on the ship and on the raft that he turns out to be a raven nut and never has the pleasure of learning that his aim is still so good that he can put tree slugs in a moving target with the span of a baby's hand. Why, George, I say to gentleman George, then you are the victim of a great wrong, and I will see the governor or somebody in your behalf at once. They cannot do this to you when, according to your own story, you are not directly connected with the matter of Mrs. Colonel Samuel B. Venus, and it is only a case of mistaken identity at best. Yes, yeah, sure, gentleman George says. They are not taking the severe measures they contemplate with me because of anything that happens to Mrs. Colonel Samuel B. Venus. They are vexed with me, George says, because one night I take Lou Adolia's automobile out on the salt meadows near Sekoskus, New Jersey, and burn it to a crisp. But it seems that I forget to remove Lou Adolia first from the scene. Well, George, I say, Bon voyage. The same to you, George says. And many of them. Yeah. That's the end of that story. And I'll be back with more in very soon. I uh, hope you're enjoying them. If you are, little thumbs up always is nice. Until next time, stay safe, be good, merciful, be kind, won't you? God bless. Bye-bye.